So I'd like to welcome everyone to DD, the second session. Um, so we're going to talk about unfreezing and refreezing to system changes learning. I'm David Ng. Um, I'm in Toronto. Um, so this is uh, nighttime here. Um, and um, we're going to work through the agenda. Uh, we're going to have um, a little bit of an introduction uh, before we get into the icebreaker. We'll then talk about rethinking systems. Uh, we'll do a presentation, have dialogue and reflection, think about uh, rethinking systems changes, um, and then rethinking system, cha system changes learning. And so we're building up those ideas. So I do live in Toronto. There's four ways in which you might know me. Um, so firstly, uh, there's a commercial side of me, which was uh, I was at, with IBM for 28 years. A lot of it was in management consulting and executive education. Um, right now, I'm spending most of my time looking after my 90-year-old father uh, in the family business. Um, that stuff uh, people don't actually um, see very much of because when you're doing consulting work, it gets hidden behind. The research, uh, I've been blogging since 2008 on coevolving.com, and so it's kind of been this movement. Um, I didn't blog before uh, 2000. Uh, six, 2008, really. Um, I started off in decision support systems, econometrics, marketing science. I got, got into the system sciences and the system thinking community as a result of an assignment um, to the Advanced Business Institute at IBM Palisades, um, and then started doing other work in service of science and on open sourcing. Um, I've taught at the Rotman School, uh, Metropolia in Finland, um, uh, University of Toronto, Tongji University in China. Uh, and I'm a husband for all that period. Um, my wife is, would be my, by me all that time. I'm the father of four sons, uh, which is probably my biggest achievement, and I've recently become an in-law, so I'm learning to do that. Uh, no grandkids yet. So we're going to start off with this idea of change as three steps, and it originally was authored or uh, attributed to Kurt Lewin, or Levine as people pronounce it, but he actually never said that. He never wrote the idea of rephrase, and there's this article um, that is uh, posted here, and it says that Change of three steps has come to regard as both an objective self-evident truth and an ideal of the noble provenance. And so we can argue about the history about this, about whether um, the idea of unfreeze, change, refreeze, or unfreeze, move, refreeze, if you want to get really close to what uh, Levine was actually writing, is um, right or wrong or who, who it comes to or is it used for. But the question that we should ask is, if we don't do change as three steps, what is it we do? How would we approach it differently? So there is uh, this, this from my friend David Hawk, and he talks about reality in two ways. Reality on the left, you could see as a changelessness state, and this goes back to Parmenides and Confucius. The idea is that you have, in effect, a solid, I kind of go back to Plato, and uh, you have a shift and some stability, and then it, it gets sustainability. This is an analytical paradigm. Uh, now it's been taking things apart, but it starts from these mathematical principles, uh, and logic, and then works its way down. The other alternative would be reality as a change of state, not uh, reality as a state of change, not a change of state. There was a Greek philosopher, Heraclitus, that took this approach. Uh, Lao Tzu in the Tao Te Ching uh, did it in Chinese philosophy. In this, there's the beauty of the dynamic. Um, as in the left side, you're kind of looking at stability as a thing you want. On the right side, it's all dynamic. And the contextual appreciation means that it's not universal. It depends on the context and the world. So um, the image we have here is you never walk in the same river twice. Um, and it changes, con that context changes um, frequently. So we're now going to go into the icebreaker, um, and the icebreaker is that question. When is, change, when is change as three steps an appropriate approach, and when might you look for an alternative? OK. Rethinking systems, and so I'm going to do a little um, uh, summary. So um, this this whole program started in 2013 when I was president of the International Society of System Sciences, and we're working on systems thinking. And there's a lot in the history 
uh, with system thinking, but what I felt at that time was that it, a lot of it's 20th century. And um, the people that had, had done that work, if you go back into like post-World War II, um, never had to experience the internet and globalization like we had. So uh, the, the ideas I brought up in 2013 were one, the Anthropocene, and two, the service economy and service science that was coming up at that time. And so um, that was the proposition. In 2019, we formed the System Changes Learning Circle in Toronto. And the idea behind that was um, the, I knew there was going to be a hard problem to look at. And I said, I'm looking for a group of people who are willing to meet for 10 years, at least tri-weekly. And I had uh, three other people join me. And so we've been working on things. Uh, on the right side is a workshop we had, we did for Code for Canada with the Canadian Digital Service on thinking, system thinking through changes. And so we've been piloting some of these ideas uh, in practice. In 2022, this is the major article on uh, system changes learning on, re on um, recasting and reifying rhythmic shifts. So we're trying to orient people to stop thinking in terms of a straight line from A to B and moving towards rhythmic shifts. Um, Later in 2023, there's an article that's published on multi-paradigm inquiry. This is a more academic article because in order to do that, we dragged our way through architectural design, ecological anthropology, and classical Chinese medicine to end up with a philosophy system rhythms. Uh, at the beginning of this year, we wrote a paper, this one's a really philosophical paper, uh, looking at pragmatism, going back to the work of West Churchman and Russell Acoff and coming through and making that transition into the classical Chinese medicine. And the last one on the right is an article that uh, should be published in the International Journal of Organization Theory and Behavior. It's, uh, and the question was about how, uh, how the pandemic has changed the nature of work. And so this is an application of the ideas that we had in changing the way we see the world. So if we go back to the history, the post-World War II social psychologists uh, followed Kurt Levine, Kurt, Le Kurt Lewin, and led to three systems perspectives at the Tavistock Institute for Human Relations. And they are the socio-psychological systems perspective. Um, the way to think about this is primarily about post-war um, veterans coming back um, and trying to adjust to society in Britain. And what that study was about was how all the society would adjust to the people as much as the people would adjust to the society. The second one, socio-technical systems perspective, had its history in the coal mines. And originally, the way that mining was done was you'd send men with pickaxes and shovels down into a coal mine, and they'd work as a team, become family. But the introduction of a machine meant that you had this long wall, and suddenly people were acting like, pushing a crank and moving things along, and they weren't working as teams anymore. So they needed a new way of looking at, uh, at the work that was being done. The third one, the socio-ecological systems perspective, came about because there was so much change. And so the question was, how do you deal with change? Um, this is more inter-organizational uh, as opposed to the socio-psychological and the socio-technical that are more inside the enterprise. There's a long history of systems thinking, and so um, people say oh, you say, oh, I do system thinking, and they talk to me and go, oh, I don't do that type of system thinking. So we start off with early cybernetics, uh, with the ideas of man and machine, and trying to figure out uh, information and how people translate with that. Uh, general systems theory is trying to learn across types of systems, and so we can learn from biology, we can learn from uh, ecology, we learn from social systems. They're all different types of systems we try to use uh, ideas across them. System dynamics tend to be more mathematical approach. You build models and you learn from the models. Uh, soft and critical systems approaches are probably the most popular at this point. This is actually social systems, um, focused on social systems. And so as compared to general systems theory that says there's something looking on all systems, um, soft and critical systems is basically social systems work. Later cybernetics brings in more of the information content. You have ideas like the viable systems model and um, uh, autopoiesis and uh, those other ideas come out. Uh, complexity theory um, came originally, um, Prigozhin had the uh, Nobel Prize in chemistry um, and trying to work through chaos. Um, and then learning systems, when we th stop thinking about the system as being static and more about something that develops. So of the three, uh, of, of, the, of these areas, the ones that I tend to lean closest to are general systems theory, soft and critical systems, and learning systems. 
what we've done since 2019 is actually add on some other newer ideas. So practice theory comes from uh, reading down through philosophy, philosophy of Heidegger. You end up with ideas like um, Dreyfus has written a book, uh, What Computers Can't Do. Uh, Etienne Wenger is the one that's uh, created work on communities of practice. Uh, socio-ecological systems with uh, C.S. Halling has now become, uh, with Rockstrom the, uh, and the work on resilience, um, the idea of planetary boundaries. Uh, service systems, the shift from product, creating products to creating services. Uh, systemic design with the crossover between um, designers from design schools and uh, systems people. Ecological anthropology. Uh, which is how people interact with each other uh, from an anthropological perspective. And the last one is post-colonial and Chinese philosophy of science. So this has been helpful in starting off with uh, foundations coming through the philosophical foundations of classical Chinese medicine. And the reason I've done that is, uh, is because the science, if you believe that Chinese medicine is a science, uh, must have a foundation underneath it and it actually backs you in in a concrete way to the ideas of yin and yang. Um, there's been work more recently uh, on post-colonial approaches crossing over from Western medicine to Chinese medicine. Um, interesting studies of, uh, of how in Taiwan they actually treat with, with classical Chinese med medical techniques, but they bill by Western codes because that's the way they're set up. So a short definition of system thinking, it's a perspective on parts, holes, and their relations. And so when we talk about that, function is contribution of the part to the whole. Um, and we generally talk about people and roles rather than as functions, but that's okay. Uh, structure is an arrangement in space. Then there's two other ideas. One is process, which is an arrangement in time. And behavior, which is system changes, which initiates other events. So it's interactions um, between systems. Now the skill testing question when we do this is, which comes first, structure or process? And the answer, actually, I had this, I, I didn't know this answer myself. I was walking across a field at one of the conferences and uh, talking to someone, and I had to ask that question. He said, oh, it's obvious. And I said, well, it's not obvious to me. Uh, he said, process comes first. Process comes first because if you look at a mountain, a mountain actually changes in time. It's just from our point of view that it's a structure because we think it doesn't change, but it does change. So the idea of process comes first, and process can happen at various paces and various speeds, which is why we reorient that way. So you'll find the work that we're doing has actually been trying to move people from the idea of function and structure towards process and behavior. With authentic systems thinking, and this from Russ Acoff, um, synthesis precedes analysis. When you think, think synthetically, take the parts and you put them together in a whole. And so there's this um, old philosophical question, you know, how do you create a tree? Well, you give a tree, you, you give them soil, you give them water, you have a seed and you go, well, can you do that? You know, um, uh, if I give you all that, will you guarantee me a tree? And the answer is, well, not only God creates trees. Um, but the idea of putting a tree together is something that happens in nature. And it happens that you get photosynthesis during the day, you get cellular respiration at night. So you have that cycle um, uh, that it, it, it depends on the weather, it depends on the climate. Thinking analytically, you can think of a tree, the only way you're going to find out what's inside a tree is to cut it down, um, and then you've probably killed the tree. So um, analytically works really great when you're thinking about machines. It doesn't work so well when you're actually trying to think about social systems and ecosystems and how things fit together and you put things together. At the bottom of the slide, I'd say that system change is learning, the, the way that we look at it, um, adds to the synthesis precedes analysis, the idea of thinking dyadically over time. And this is when we're talking about the processes as opposed to talking about the structures, because, um, and this is uh, the shortcut into yin yang, uh, is that you think about the changes, not the endpoints. And so the sun waxing, which is increasing in strength, and waning is decreasing in strength. You can think about that cycle when the sun rises and goes down. And uh, dyadic is not dualistic, and this will be something we discuss in April when we have the next session. Um, and, uh, the, and yin yang is that idea of waxing and waning, which is processes, as opposed to the dual, which would be sun and no sun. And so there's a distinction that has to be worked out there. 
Now, general systems theory, I'd said, was one of the foundations. This is looking across uh, the types of ways of organizing systems. And this is a, a paper from uh, 1956, so it's quite old. Um, Bolden created a, a, a structure and what happens is that we're talking about what is the simplest system and what gets more complicated, more complex as we go along. So the simplest thing is, is, is frameworks. Then you get the simple dynamic systems because you're looking for change like clockworks. Uh, control systems uh, like a thermostat. Open systems, and the open systems are where la life begins to differentiate itself from not life. Um, the genetic social level, and there you have plants. You have, if you actually go into uh, study uh, plants, you end up also studying communities of plants and how they work together with each other. You have the animal level, animals move, humans have self-consciousness, uh, symbolic systems, um, like information systems, then transcendental systems that we can't really know. So when we talk about systems, people often come in with that idea of clockworks. Um, and that's the mechanisms and and so it takes some change and the question is can you get them to switch out of that into the genetic societal level and say no it's not a machine you have to think about this differently there are, are various levels here i tend to actually like working not at the human level the human level is more complex than the animal level it's more complex than the genetic level but what you'll see in and, and a lot of our discussions um that that we've had uh, have helped if we don't talk about human beings. Uh, we talk about beavers a lot because beavers have a nature. Uh, so if you start talking about whether human beings have nature, you kind of get into trouble sometimes. But you say, well, beavers actually have a nature and they will cut down trees naturally. They can't stand the, uh, the sound of running water. And so we use those metaphors in order to move people along and say there are different types of systems. If you want to think about systems in a different way, and you're working in an organization, maybe you should think about beavers, maybe you should think at another level. So here is the, um, the uh, breakout we're gonna have. And, and, and the question is, what if we resequence thinking our systems as genetic social before clockworks? So one way of looking at systems analytically is, okay, we're gonna understand what's happening in the clock. That means we're gonna take the clock apart. We have to actually look inside. The other one would be, well, let's actually look at beavers as an example and look at how they work in the environment. Um, so they're in the uh, water, they're in the trees, and they're dens, and they, they have their nature. So let's go to another breakout. Okay, so we're going to move from um, uh, from rethinking systems to rethinking system changes. Uh, now, there has been um, a lot of interest recently in systems change. Though 2017, the OECD has a, uh, a public server, public sector innovation observatory. Uh, there's been publications in the Stanford Social Innovation Review. Uh, UNDP has stuff from 2022, and then the one that's really close to us is. Um, the uh, Forum for the Future and the McConnell Foundation had a meeting on Wasson Island, just a little bit north of us, where they brought together um, the Social Innovation Exchange members uh, and were talking about systems change. But when they were talking about systems change, they said, well, we're actually not going to define systems change, we're just not trying to build community around it. And so that left a gap of, well, what is a systems change and what is not a systems change? Uh, when we started this project, I, I was looking around because I have a lot of websites and I thought, oh, we should actually create a new domain. And so it turns out that systemschanges.com is available because no one's ever thought that there's more than one system and more than one change. So there must be something going on there. So two approaches to this, if you look at psychology and the history of psychology, is in behavioral psychology, which is what's inside your head, as opposed to an ecological approach that asks, what is your head inside of? And so this is fundamentally what was meant by ecological. Uh, it's not really about trees and uh, as people might think and plants and the nature around us. Uh, it is about the way you approach. And so behavioral psychology is going outside in. Ecological approach is going inside out. Um, the typical example of stimulus response that, with a foundation of behavioral psychology 
was like Pavlov's dog. You ring the bell and they salivate. Well, what's happening inside the dog's head? In the ecological approach to perception that J.J. Gibson has, what he was trying to understand was how pilots land on an aircraft carrier. And the uh, aircraft is moving, the carrier is moving, and looking inside the head of the pilot doesn't necessarily help. So what he was trying to do is actually try to figure out how is it that the, the aircraft and the carrier get synced up so that they could actually get a successful landing. And that's, that's fundamentally the, the difference in approach. Now, we also have a difference in, in some confusion between distinguishing systematic change from systemic change. Systematic change is somatic change, which means adaptive or cellular change that happens inside a body. Uh, a syst systemic change is a genotypic change, which tends to be generational. And so if you're looking for systemic change, it usually doesn't happen within the same generation. Systematic change happens in non-living effect producing systems. That's allopoietic, and I'll come back to that in a second. Living systems um, are systems generating and they're autopoietic. So those of you who've been in the knowledge management literature might have recognized the, the term autopoiesis, which means self-generating. Self-generating is what a cell and a living being does because we reproduce all the cells in our body um, in a couple of days. Allopoietic is, a, is like an assembly line where you put all these pieces and then when you get to the end, the product is not what the parts were. So you don't get the reproduction. You're building a car. You don't have a car that grows up along the, uh, uh, along the assembly line and comes out the end. So uh, when you have systematic change, you tend to be, have reactive mode because you have a change and then the system is programmed to respond a certain way or has a certain number of options of ways to, to respond. Systemic change tends to be co-responsive, that you've got more than one whole working with another whole. So part of the uh, distinctions we need to think about is when you, t then when you think systematic, you tend to think about part whole. When you think about systemic, you tend to think about holes alongside other holes working in time. Now, we've been doing this with um, uh, facilitating the people, and they found this, this helpful, which is a distinction between, if, if you're talking about holes among other holes, there's a lot going on. So we talk about the differentiation between urgent and important along the x-axis and local and distant along the y-axis. And so ten, people tend to focus a lot on local and urgent. And this would be, as an example, um, if you're going to talk about medicine, if you're on a battlefield and it's local and it's urgent, you've got a soldier who's been injured, you have to treat them in the battlefield. If you don't, they'll die. If you go to the next one, local and important, well, that stuff can be done at a neighborhood clinic. And so, you know, just just do regular checkups. You know, if you have a little thing, just go to the family clinic and, and get it taken care of. You can do that locally. It doesn't require actually traveling very far. If you go up to the upper left, uh, you have the distant and urgent, and you have trauma centers. So um, people will get put into an ambulance and taken to not just any hospital, but taken to a trauma center because they have all the specialists there that can deal with that. And the last category, of, of uh, distant and important, you do an operating room. You schedule all the people, uh, cataract surgeries, knee surgeries, these are things which are not, they're important, but they're not urgent. And they can be done more effectively in distance. So what happens though is that all these shift. And so if something is done, uh, is not done, that's important, it may turn out that it's gonna shift into becoming urgent. And, so, and, and if you want to make change in the world, a lot of the issues that we have is that we tend to work locally, and the question is how do you connect to a distant issue? It's like climate change is a distant issue, and it's important, but it's not urgent. But if we don't focus on climate change, then um, we're, we're, we're not we're going to work on that problem. Okay, so as we go to breakout, here's the question. What if we resequence the thinking on system changes as ecological before behavioral? On the left side, we have the behavioral approach, which is, okay, if we want to understand what's going on, what we should do is dig in and look inside the person's head. The ecological approach is much more like uh, couples dancing, social dancing. And here we have couples who are moving together. Uh, so you have 
two of them and not only do you have the interaction between the pair but they have to make sure they don't run into other people because everyone's moving at the same time so with that we'll go into a breakout can you resequence and think ecological before behavioral Okay, so we covered rethinking systems and rethinking systems changes. Um, now I'm going to talk about system changes learning. And learning in the system sense actually means more than just cognitive. So um, we think about systems in general. We can talk about a state maintaining system that can adapt to events as opposed to a living system with memory that can learn from experience. So there's a difference in the system's definitions between adapting and learning. So on the left side, we have the state maintaining system adapts by discriminating between states because you have to see what the different conditions are um, and then reacting to the conditions with deterministic behaviors because again, this is the connection is like a machine. So it's like this problem connects to this solution sort of thing. A living system learns to produce an outcome by attaining a state in different ways and under different conditions and responding with events in the choice of behavior. And so the question then comes about um, what, uh, what, what can you learn? And this is where you get into learning systems um, and describing it. So the, the image we have of dolphins is actually chosen because of the work of Gregory Bateson had done this. Um, and the question is, can dolphins learn and to what extent can they learn? Here's three levels of learning that, um, that came from uh, Bateson. Uh, the first one is proto-learning, um, changes in response, correcting errors within a set of alternatives. And so this would be like giving, uh, having the, the dolphin do a trick, you give it a treat, it doesn't know the trick, you give a treat, and uh, you learn to do that one thing over and over again. Um, the metaphor that we could take on this, if we look at food service um, and cooking, is that Training on food service and handling for consistency is what cafeteria kitchens want. You don't necessarily won't expect gourmet cooking out of a cafeteria. You want them not to kill people uh, so or poison them or cause problems. So there is a place for proto-learning, which is just these are the programs we run. This is the way we do things. We try to reduce the number of errors and we control for that. The second level, deuteral learning, uh, relates somewhat to the double loop learning that Chris Ardress had created. Um, change in response correcting the set of alternatives so if you're in the proto learning state what happens is you only have a certain number of responses what happens if you want to add another response to it if we take the cooking example and we go with food prep again the culinary institute of america you go there you learn french cooking then you learn italian cooking and you can learn chinese cooking and you learn different styles and so when doing so they're different different alternatives and sets that you can choose from. The last one of trital learning is actually taking the change in response into contexts. And this one would be taking the dolphin out of the tank and putting it in the ocean. Uh, can, they, can they learn to do that? Um, the metaphor here would be Hell's Kitchen where you're on TV cooking and the teams are, on, are constantly changing and um, you're getting challenges with individuals and so you get that change. We know that people can do proto-learning. We know people can do deutero learning. The question is, can people actually do trito learning? Um, this is a personal family experiment. Uh, for I have four sons. Um, the first son, I was playing a badminton with him for a year, and I said, well, after you graduate grade 12, we're going to apply to a Canadian university, but would you like to go to China for two years? And the purpose of going there is to learn the language and learn the culture. I don't really care what the grade is going to be. And so he went. And then he, he went to China, uh, all the four sons actually, they're kind of two years apart, so they all went after him. Um, but when they came back, it was interesting, the response. Um, so I took uh, my first two sons uh, to Japan and their first perception was, oh, Japan is gonna be like China, like our experience. But when they got there, it's like, oh no, Japan is totally different, but they didn't have any problem adjusting. Uh, my fourth son uh, went on, a, uh, uh, um, on an exchange trip to uh, Quebec and his response afterwards was, 
yes, it was totally French in Quebec, but you know, we have a lot of French, all the, in, we're bilingual in Toronto as well. You can't go anywhere without reading these French signs as well. So, so there's an ability to do trito learning, but that means going to a different environment and learning th something different. Now, a Western approach is often based off an idea when you talk about management on bias for action. Uh, bias for action in the description by Tom Peters, actually originally in uh, Search of Excellent, uh, it's the first content chapter uh, of eight. And he says that in effect, you should actually have this bias for action. The idea of a manager is that you do stuff. But if you look at the alternative, it's a Hippocratic Oath. The Hippocratic Oath says, first, do no harm. And it's an interesting distinction here because the bias for action you might associate with machine, turning the machine off or moving the machine forward, make that increment. But if you take a Hippocratic Oath, it's different from that, which says you want to do no harm. And it's a system that's in operation. You might not want to change that. This leads us into a little bit of Chinese philosophy. People may have heard of the phrase Wu Wei. Let me unpack that for you. Um, Way is the application of force of willpower and determination. So what that means is actually could be intervention or action, but the alternative is a little better to understand in Wu Wei, which doesn't mean not taking action, but letting nature take its course and not interfering. And so we end up in, if we go over to Chinese philosophy, there's this fundamental question about nature that is not necessarily the same way in the West that we see nature and whether you you actually intervene or don't intervene or you just let things be. Now, this means that what you could do is opposed to direct intervention is indirect intervention and having people change uh, because they want to change that direction. Uh, one of the things that I espouse is that we should look for people that will do the right thing for the wrong reasons. And the reason they will do the right thing for the wrong reasons is because that's in their nature to do that. Uh, they're they're going to do the wrong thing, but let's try to get them to do the right thing for the wrong reasons. Um, if you don't do that and you wait for them to do the right thing for the right reasons, you're going to be waiting a very long time. So we could take this into um, a lot of business examples. As an example, we have a housing issue now. Uh, one approach would be, oh, we should have the government do uh, take care of everything. And the other approach would be, no, we actually want developers to do those things. How would we set up the conditions so that the developers will actually do what they naturally want to do within the direction that we would like them to do that? So Wu Wei is something we'll come back to in another, another time. The difference in philosophy between the Western approach on the left and the Chinese approach um, gets down to the what we call the difference between a dualistic approach and a contextual dyadic approach. The first difference is in in truth and falsity. In falsity. So in the Western logic, you have abstract and permanent independent of context assertions in effect that this is true and it is true. If you take mathematics, one and one always equals two. We can extrapolate from the propositions we build upwards. In the Chinese logic, the application of meaning is relative to the particular context. And so the question is, well, what context do you, do you take that in? And so as opposed to looking at the law, so we, we, we have on the uh, right, the Western idea of law, which is, you know, there is a right and there is a wrong. The Chinese approach would be, well, in this context, um, it would be good or it would not be good. Um, there's the, the idea of right or wrong is not the same in that philosophy. The pairings in, uh, in, the, in the Western philosophy are, are in oppositions, superior, inferior, subordinate, subordinate, intrinsic value, non-intrinsic value, human, non-human. But in the Chinese philosophy, the context um, makes a difference and a term presupposes its opposite. So when you say cat, um, you, uh, when you're comparing it, you, you're saying, well, it's, it, it's a cat or it's a not a cat. It's, and the not cat does not mean everything else in the universe. The co there's a context dependence because when you talk about oppositions, so the idea of men and women, you could ask the question, well, there's no such thing as superior or inferior. The question is when or where, and the when and where is a context. The frames in Western logic, hierarchical, reductionist, and thing ontology. Uh, the frames in Chinese philosophy, yin-yang, which are processes. 
uh, harmonious whole, which is the ecological approach, and a mutually engendering or constraining uh, or, uh, context around that. So more resequencing. And, and this now gets down to the idea of propensity and causality. So causality is, is on the left side. Um, I have a little billiards game going on here. You hit the ball, it hits another ball, and you end up with cause and effect. On the right side, we take propensity. You have a ship sailing through um, the ocean. It's going through weather. It's going through the climate, uh, through uh, changes in the day. You're going to see actually rain show up on the um, on the screen if we wait long enough. There it is. There's the rain. And the question would be, when is the best time to sail? So we're not looking for causality from getting to A to B so much as when would be the right time. The idea of propensity is also related to, uh, Francois Julien's the uh, philosopher, relates it to Sun Tzu, um, that you would attack at the right time, um, and timing makes a difference. Okay, so we'll go to breakout with this question about propensity and causality. <laughs>